Hello, and welcome once again to Lato's Law. I'm Steve Lato, attorney at Law in the State of Michigan, where I've been practicing law for 26 years in the fields of consumer protection and lemon law. I often heard about the stuff from places like roadandtrack.com, and I've written a few books as well. And I survived the cold apocalypse. For those of you who caught last week's show, I had a cold. I shot it a day early. The cold did set in the next day, but I survived. I got some very nice well wishes from some viewers, so thank you very much for those. I appreciate it. And I survived and actually went and spoke at a conference in Florida, the National Association of Attorneys General, which we might talk about in a future episode. Today, we're going to talk about the Paul Walker Settlements Explained. The Paul Walker Settlements Explained. You may have heard the story, of course, about Paul Walker. Uh, He was a Fast and Furious uh, star, among other things. And uh, he was involved in an automobile accident, uh, to put it lightly. Uh, Walker was on a break from filming the seventh installment in the Furious series when he and a guy named Roger Rodas decided to drive away from a charity event in Valencia on November 30th, 2013. So that's a few years ago already. Um, And you might remember that um, I think they were shooting Fast and Furious 7, and they weren't complete yet with the shooting, but they managed to finish the film without him using some digital trickery, uh, which is a nice thing, and they actually did a nice little send-off at the end of the film about him. But um, investigators said that the vehicle that he was traveling in as a passenger uh, was doing about 90 miles per hour when it smashed into several trees and a concrete light pole on uh, a street in Valencia, and both men died very quickly as a result of injuries sustained in the crash. And a lot of people in the um, automotive community have weighed in on this, because, of course, lawsuits followed the crash. And among the people sued were the driver of the car, who was Roger Rodas, and um, the manufacturer of the car, which was Porsche. And uh, a lot of people were curious about how that works. So I'm not going to get very heavily into how product liability works, because among other things, it varies from state to state. California famously has probably the most strict product liability laws in the nation. And in fact, what they have is called strict product liability. Now, many states have followed suit. That, if, that is that California was probably the first state to adopt what we called strict product liability. But many states then followed them after they did that. And what that means simply is this. Uh, generally speaking, in a product liability case, you have to prove that the manufacturer of the product um, did something wrong that caused the product to injure somebody. And by that, I'm again, I'm generalizing. You know, as two or three product liability attorneys who are watching this already punching their computers. But there's often described three different ways you can get product liability. One is if you can show negligence, okay? So if I can show that the manufacturer of the product or the seller of the product was negligent somehow in how that product was made, manufactured, or put in the stream of commerce... If that negligence resulted in harm to somebody, then you can sue the manufacturer. That's the negligence theory. Then, of course, you've got the warranty theory, and that is there's something inherently wrong with the product that caused it to not conform to its warranty. And I'm not talking about the glove box warranty we talk about with cars, but the idea that a product is merchantable, for instance. If the product is put out in an unmerchantable fashion and that caused harm to somebody, again, you could, you could sue for that. But those both require you to show either the breach of a a, a duty with negligence or the breach of a warranty with the warranty theory. And strict product liability actually lowered the standard for a plaintiff, somebody who's injured, to simply say, this product was unsafe and therefore the manufacturer is responsible for putting it out like that. Not needing to show a breach of a duty, not needing to show a breach of warranty, simply that the product was somehow unsafe. And that's the strict product liability. Now, I mentioned that many states have adopted strict product liability, but many states in more recent years have also dialed that back a little bit. So, for instance, Michigan a few years ago passed a series of defenses that manufacturers can raise when they put out a product and injure somebody, among other things, if they can prove that the product was state-of-the-art, for instance, that, that that's the best that could be done at that time. That's a defense. So, That's Michigan. So back to California, strict product liability. And so Paul Walker and Roger Rodas die in this accident where a Porsche hits a tree and bursts into flames. And now there's a lot of speculation about this. I've seen documentaries on it. I've read articles about it. I've got articles in front of me about it. I'm not going to get into the mechanics of the crash, uh, but we do know that there were a couple things going on here, one of which was that Paul Walker was the passenger in the car, 
and the car was being driven too fast, i.e. it was speeding. There's no question the car was speeding. I actually read a very good article written, I believe, by Matt Farah, uh, who talked about whether or not the tires on the car were appropriate, because if the car was an older car with the original tires, for instance, tires lose stickiness over time, especially if they're in certain environments. And he said that he thought that perhaps the tires contributed to the problem, which might be true. However, the estates of Roger Rodas and uh, the estate of Paul Walker, which I believe was basically his daughter and his parents, uh, filed lawsuits against various people. And of course, Paul Walker's sued the driver's estate, because he's passed away, as well as Portia. And then, of course, the driver's estate simply sued Portia. So what you need to know, among other things, is first of all, there was two settlements in this case. There were two settlements. One settlement happened a couple of years ago and kind of went under the radar a little bit. And then there's a more recent settlement that happened last week. So the first settlement, however, we actually know a bit more about this than, than we often do. Uh, the daughter of the Fast and Furious star Paul Walker reached a $10.1 million settlement with the estate of Roger Rodas. And this happened um, last year in April. Um, the estate uh, of Roger Rodas, which Roger was a longtime friend of Walker's, and he was the one who was driving the Porsche Carrera GT that the two men died in in 2013, agreed to place more than $7.2 million in a trust for Walker's teenage daughter, Meadow, uh, according to the terms of a settlement that was reached in November of 2014, and it was just publicized in 2016. And about $2.9 million of that went aside for legal fees and court costs and things of that nature. But overall, universally, it was a $10 million settlement. Uh, it was unclear why the terms of the settlement even became public. Uh, Walker's name is not mentioned in the court filings, but Meadow, who was a juvenile at the time of the, uh, of the settlement, is listed as Meadow W. in the court filings. And people figured out very quickly that this is, in fact, the Rodas estate settling with the Paul Walker estate. Uh, Meadow Walker and Rodas's widow, Christine, did file wrongful death suits against Portia, however, and that's what we'll be talking about in a second, claiming various basic uh, design flaws or mechanic failings which led to the crash. Uh, investigators of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and the California Highway Patrol both ruled that speed was the main factor in the wreck, but lawsuits contend that the vehicle was traveling slower than the police have indicated. This is all from the Los Angeles Times, by the way. These are not my opinions. Uh, and um, my opinion is, if, in fact, they were doing as fast as some people say they were, speed was a factor. Uh, and now, a judge did throw out Rodas's suit earlier. Uh, an attorney representing Meadow Walker said Friday that uh, news of the settlement with Rodas um, should have no effect on her pending suit against Portia. So it's interesting because it looks like the driver's estate filing a lawsuit against Porsche got thrown out, but the same claim made by the passenger didn't get thrown out. Possible reasons that that could have happened, but we'd have to speculate. Uh, through his estate, Mr. Rodas, the driver, uh, did take partial responsibility for the crash uh, through his attorneys, of course, which Paul Walker, um, according to the other attorneys, uh, would have survived, they said, uh, their lawsuit on behalf of Meadow against Porsche AG, which is a $13 billion corporation, I always like to point out, uh, the attorneys say they intend to hold the company responsible for producing a vehicle that was defective and caused Paul Walker's death. So the question, of course, then becomes uh, if, in fact, the car is being driven well over the speed limit and it crashes in broad daylight on dry pavement, um, how responsible is Porsche for the injuries that result from that versus how responsible is the driver of the vehicle? Uh, and that, of course, is the entire question. So they were proceeding on the theory that Paul Walker had survived the crash but couldn't get his seatbelt unbuckled to get out of the car. That was their argument uh, that the estate was making. And, of course, if that's true, if there was something defective with the seatbelts, that would be a problem. I also saw someplace that there's an argument regarding the fuel system in the vehicle and whether or not the fuel system had the proper shutoffs and things of that nature so that when the car crashes, it doesn't continue to pump fuel into the car, for instance, uh, instead of you know into the combustion chamber where it's supposed to go. Um, and so that was the fight going back and forth. Uh, but it was just revealed recently 
And Paul Walker's daughter settled the claim with Portia. And this appears to wrap up the case now in its entirety. Now, we don't know how much money she got, but we guess that she got some money. And I'll explain that in a second. But remember that she got $10 million from the driver's family. So she was continuing with her lawsuit against Portia, and this two sides settled. And as I like to tell everyone I talk to who asks me this question, 99.9% of all lawsuits settle. So for every case you see going to trial, there are 999 cases that didn't go to trial. And that's because those cases settle or get thrown out. Now, cases get thrown out of court because they're so weak that they literally can't withstand the first glance that a judge takes at them. They're frivolous or whatever, or they're not grounded in fact, or there's something legally wrong with them. They're suing the wrong party, they're suing the wrong state, that kind of thing. But cases that have some level of merit will almost always settle. Now, they'll settle where neither side is completely happy. So Portia probably paid more money than they wanted to to settle this case. And Paul Walker's daughter probably got less money than she wanted from Portia. But what generally happens is the attorneys get together with their clients and say, look, you got to weigh all kinds of things here. If we go to court and win, we could get this much. But if we go to court and lose, you get zero. And of course, if you're Portia, you say, we could go to court and win and pay zero. But if we go to court and lose, in a very public case because of an extremely famous person who died you might pay through the nose. And of course, paying through the nose might get knocked down on appeal, but no one wants to be the party that's fighting against having to pay like a hundred million dollar judgment. Because among the elements of your damages, if you've killed somebody, you may have to pay for their lost earnings for the rest of their career, for instance. And Mr. Walker was a star on the rise in a franchise that's gigantic. So those are all things that both sides play out. So When you're thinking about how to settle a case and what you might get, obviously the Walker side is going, well, we've already got 10 million from the one estate and now, you know, we want whatever from Portia, but they'll take less if it guarantees them something, the bird in the hand kind of thing. So uh, Paul Walker's daughter, who previously settled with the estate of the man who was driving in the fatal crash that killed her father in 2013 now has settled her wrongful death suit against Portia. Uh, Jeff Milam, her attorney, told the Los Angeles Times, again, the matter has been resolved to the satisfaction of all involved. And what they did is they entered into a settlement agreement, and part of that agreement, I'm sure, is that neither side will talk about what they paid, or what was paid. Uh, Meadow Walker was 16 when she filed suit against the automaker in 2015, alleging that her father initially survived the crash, but died because he couldn't release his seatbelt, as it burned after a high-speed crash in Santa Clarita. Now she's 18. She reached the uh, settlement in October. According to documents obtained by The Blast, uh, the deal, terms of which were confidential, include a request that the wrongful death case be dismissed and also notes that the Fast and Furious franchise actor's father, Paul William Walker III, had also reached an agreement with the car maker. Uh, Meadow Walker's attorney, Jeff Milam, alleged uh, in the lawsuit that was filed that the GT was not designed to protect its occupants in a crash properly, uh, even at speeds below its advertised capabilities. And here's where Porsche got into a little bit of an issue here. Uh, This car was sold as a race car with a 605 horsepower engine capable of doing 205 miles per hour. And that's something people always scratch their heads about. They say, okay, If you buy a car that can do 205 miles per hour and you put a license plate on it, you still aren't allowed to speed in it. So that's against the driver. But people look at Porsche and go, yeah, but why are you selling a car that's street legal that'll do 205? Now, I understand you can take your car to track day and race it at the track. You could take it to a closed airstrip and run it up and down the dragway. You could take it to the Nürburgring in Germany and race it all day long legally. So... It's not illegal to build a car or sell a car that fast, but if you sell a car that fast, it better be able to go along with all the other baggage it comes with being fast, including it might crash at high speeds. Now, that, of course, is the question because, according to sheriff's reports, the car could have been doing as slow as 80 miles per hour and as much as 93 miles per hour, but that was in a 45-mile-per-hour zone. So the car was doing at least 35 over and maybe more. So then... 
of course, Porsche's argument is, number one, we're not planning on that car going sideways into a tree at 90 miles an hour. And, and number two, we're not expected to be ra raced on streets that aren't designed to handle those speeds. Um, I've seen film and footage and photographs of where the crash took place. It wasn't a racetrack. It was actually a, a road that goes through, in essence, like an industrial complex. So Porsche attorneys had argued in 2015 that the actor was a knowledgeable and sophisticated user. They couldn't say he was a driver because, of course, he was the passenger. Uh, but they said he was a willing passenger. And they did say in pleadings that he was responsible for what happened to him. Um, well, not completely because that's why they got $10 million from the driver. Okay. But a judge previously dismissed a suit against Porsche brought by Christine Rodas, the widow of the driver. Um, her suit alleged that design flaws caused her husband's death. And, and a judge actually apparently stated on the record that even if the car had had a roll cage and a racing fuel cell, it wouldn't have prevented the deaths. Because he said, and apparently from the evidence in front of him, that the death was caused from blunt force trauma. So we know that Paul Walker and Roger Rodas were longtime friends. And of course, this is a tragic accident. And it's, it's very, very sad that it happened. Uh, Paul Walker was 40 when this car crashed. as a Porsche Carrera GT. And they were at a charity event, uh, which they had just left minutes earlier. Uh, and of course, there's a huge outpouring from the fans. So we don't know how much they got from Porsche, but Porsche apparently paid some money to settle the case. We assume they did. Uh, and the widow had already paid, not the widow, but the estate had already paid $10 million, the estate of the driver, to Paul Walker's estate. And the saddest part of all of this, on top of the deaths, was the fact that um, Paul Walker's daughter was getting beaten up on social media Um and many of the people who are complaining are unhappy with the settlements that she got because they're Porsche fans who have been taking their anger out on Meadows' Instagram account uh, in which she writes about the acts of kindness in honor of her father, uh, but people are responding by calling her greedy and saying that her father died because of his own actions and that she should just leave Porsche alone. Uh, and, of course, you have to imagine how difficult that would be to be a 16-year-old um, uh, daughter of a man who died so publicly and to have people attacking you, calling you greedy simply because you want to be made whole for what happened to your father. So again, there were two lawsuits that were filed by the estate of Paul Walker. One of them settled a couple of years ago for $10 million. The other one settled this week uh, for an undisclosed amount, and that appears to wrap up the case. But that is the Paul Walker settlements explained. Questions or comments is always shooting my way, Latoslaw.com, L-E-H-T-O-S-L-A-W.com. I'm on Twitter, at Steve Leto, at S-T-E-V-E-L-E-H-T-O. And this show is on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Podbean, Google Play, and YouTube. Thanks for watching and listening. Bye-bye.